Hey, hey, everyone. It's Sleepy Reader. Ah, uh, Sleepy Reader, not really Reader, aka Damien. Um, I guess this will be a bit of a sleepy vlog. I am back by the fireplace, the fireplace at my mom's house in Connecticut. I did not escape Connecticut. I was supposed to leave two days ago. And the crazy weather all over the country has just kind of befuddled the airlines and they didn't didn't do their job and they couldn't get me out of here. So I have another flight booked tomorrow and I hope this time it, it works. So anyway, um, but I got to spend more time with my mom. Uh, we watched some Alfred Hitchcock movies together and played a bunch of Scrabble and ate dinner with a bunch of other retirees. Um, so that was all good. But it also gives this also gives me a chance to talk about my big comic book or my little big, I don't know. I had a bit of a comic book adventure while on this uh, on this vacation. And it involved the great Higgy Pop comics and his favorite comic book store, Second Alarm Comics. So I man, I finally figured out how to get a hold of of Mr. Higgy. And uh, we I, we exchanged phone numbers and were able to set up a time to get together. And uh, he said, why don't we meet at Second Alarm Comics? So it actually was very easy to get there from where I am. A bit of a drive, but just a nice straight shot. And uh, I pulled into the parking lot of uh, Second Alarm. And I think there was a dance studio there also and some other businesses. Um, Anyway, I pulled up in front of the dance studio and I'm kind of fumbling with things in the car and I hear a knock against my window and I look out and there's Higgy like flexing his muscles. <laughs> he wasn't wearing his wife beater t-shirt though. He was wearing like a nice, a very nice shirt. And yeah, he looked kind of handsome and normal, <laughs> but, uh, but he was flexing his muscles. And as we were walking up to the door, uh, he decided to film me going into Second Alarm Comics. And I was like, are you going to start dancing in there? Because he had talked about doing a dance off in there. You know, I, I never believed all of Higgy's stories about uh, his adventures, <laughs> comic book shopping. But as we walked in, there were five guys in there and they were all shouting, Higgy, Higgy, it's real. They really do that at his comic shop. <laughs> I don't know if he set it up, but I don't think they knew he was coming. So now I believe every word of his stories that he tells. Um, if you don't know who Higgy Pop is, I will put a link down below. Um, and uh, you definitely should check him out. One of my all-time favorite channels on this crazy YouTube thing we do. So, but... Uh, you know, he was relatively low key compared to his videos, but he was still kind of a funny guy. And uh, and we we chatted with the owner of the shop. Both Higgy and the owner are named Jim. So I got a little confused there for a minute. And I guess the reason maybe it's called Second Alarm is because the owner is also a fire chief. So I think he just works there on the weekends. He has other people working for him, holding down the fort during on weekdays. Um, at least that was my general interpretation. And it was one of these shops that was semi disorganized. There were like boxes on top of boxes. Sometimes you had to move things to search through the boxes. But it was pretty well organized underneath, you know. There is a, cra a crazy shop elsewhere here in Connecticut uh, that was just insane. I think it's getting better now. But um, so it was a pretty cool shop. They had a very little section of new comics and then a lot of cool back issue stuff. And I bought, I bought a, a small, for me, a small number of comics and I was gifted a really cool comic by Higgy himself. And we, uh, I got to see the Hawk nest, which was incredible. I mean, it looks really cool in his videos, but somehow being there in person and the way he set it all up. I, I mean, I loved it that way. It was like comic book heaven there. And uh, and then I went upstairs and the rest of his house is like normal and really nice, a really nice house with a really nice dog with a giant cute head. And uh, and his wife is really nice and normal. So I, I don't know. He's just kind of got several identities, I think. Um, yeah, the 
the hawk dog and the <laughs> and hawk woman. I didn't see Red Sonia anywhere. Um, and uh, we looked through a lot of his comics. We uh, looked at drawings. He he draws a lot, and I'm really impressed that he sticks with it. Uh, I think he draws daily, and I need to do that. I, I draw once a week um, when I go to a drawing class. I, ha I, I pay someone to make me draw. <laughs> but anyway, so it was a delight meeting him. I loved it. Um, and that's, you know, usually the case when I meet people in person. Um, but I definitely, you know, it would it would make if uh, knowing someone like him is in Connecticut would make moving back to Connecticut a bit more interesting. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of Connecticut. I, I, I'm a grow, grew up in a certain part of Connecticut that was very dull. And uh, Higgy lives closer, maybe to the more interesting things. I don't know, or maybe he likes it dull. Uh, <clears throat> so let me show you some of the the comics I picked up. I think they all were in kind of on the rougher side of the condition and the prices were mostly okay, um, but not like blow you away, great prices, but they gave me an extra discount for being a friend of, of Higgy Pop. So that was very cool. So, uh, and there were, there were lots of bo different kinds of boxes you could dig through. Um, I kind of, uh, followed Higgy over to a Charlton box, and then it had some other interesting things in it. For instance, I picked up this treasure chest, which to the best of my understanding is a comic book that they used to um, give out maybe at Catholic schools or at schools anyway, I think Catholic schools. So I was looking at the, I haven't, I haven't read this issue yet. I just was really attracted by that cover. I thought it looked really cool. The indicia inside, there's something a little wrong here. Because it says, um, oh, you know what? I misread it. It says, published every two weeks during the school year since March 7th, 1946. I thought they were saying this was a March 7th, 1946 comic, which it clearly isn't, uh, amongst other things, because it has a approved by the Comics Code Authority. Although it's pretty old, because I, th well, I think it's pretty old, because they used to publish the stamp bigger, and then later in later years it got smaller. Although maybe that was just Marvel and DC. Um, yeah, so there isn't really a date on here that I can find. A single subscription is $2 per year. Is that, and that's twice a month? Um, oh, it's 1965. There we go. Okay, 1965. George O. Peflum, publisher. Also publisher of Young Catholic Messenger, Junior Catholic Messenger, Our Little Messenger, and Witness. So I, I don't, you know, I used to go to catechism. I didn't go to any, well, I went to a Catholic high school for one year, but um, I wonder if we ever got some of these comics. <laughs> I just don't remember it. Here's an article about Houston. <laughs> I don't know why that's in there, but it's, yeah. Little salute to Texas. Chuck White and his friends. Anyway, I, I have another t treasure chest, which I also haven't read. I will probably read this tomorrow before I hit the airplane, though. I've been working my way through these comics when I haven't been doing stuff with my mom. But I'm showing you the ones I haven't read first, and then I'll talk about the ones I have read. I loved this cover. But uh, like the others, it's it's got some kind of flaw here. It's got a, a bit out of the corner. Um, but anyway, I love this cover. This is an issue of Captain America I do not own. So I picked that up. And then they had a whole box of famous monsters that were all in really rough condition and they were not in bags um, and they were not priced. And I think this is the one thing I maybe paid too much for, but I'm not sure of the value of famous monsters, but it's number 57 and it's really beat up. And so when I got it up to the counter, they put it in a bag and board and asked me for $10 for it. And I don't know if that's a good price or not, but anyway. I wanted to get a few famous monsters. And I think on eBay, the early ones were quite expensive, so I didn't get them. I got something else. Okay, and here I got some more Captain America. Captain America 104. And if you remember, Captain America got his own magazine at number 100. So this is still pretty early in Captain America having his own full-size magazine. He was 
what was it? Tales of Suspense. He had half a magazine. Um, so did he share that with Iron Man or who was the other half? Anyway, these ones have these, the two that I got have fantastic Jack Kirby art with kind of nonstop action, but I haven't finished reading this one. But this is the one where the Red Skull takes over, makes Captain America work for him, I believe. Um, so that'll be interesting. And uh, yeah, just love the artwork. Nice, nice, nice old comic book smell. Um, and then I did read Captain America 102. So I now have 102 and 104. I guess I need 103 and 101. I don't know if I want to spend the money on 100, actually. I'm too cheap. But anyway, this one is in really bad shape. You probably can't see it on the camera, but it's it's really just like it was dipped in water at some point or left sitting in a puddle. But I guess that's why <laughs> that's why it had a price that I was willing to pay. Um, but it's a it's just fantastic Jack Kirby stuff with inks by Sid Shores, and I think I think Sid Shores is kind of underrated as a Kirby uh, inker. He did a really good job. You know, not as good as the very best Kirby inkers who I would consider Joe Sinnott, Mike Royer, and Bill Everett. Those are my favorite inkers on Kirby. Um, but yeah, this one I this one I read and it was it was nonstop action. I it does seem like maybe, you know, my assumption with a lot of this Kirby stuff is that he pretty much went home and drew whatever he wanted and then Stan Lee had to make up a story around it. And I think he just liked having fun uh, drawing lots of action, drawing Captain America fighting. Um, later when he wrote, you know, when he was the official writer of Captain America, when he came back, I think he had bigger plot ideas, but here it's just endless fighting against different minions of the Red Skull, basically. Um, but just Kirby action that you that just can't be beat. In the back is an article by Douglas Munch. Munch. In other words, Doug Munch or Mensch, who became a writer at Marvel um, in 1968. Was it 68 or 67? Has an article in here. Uh, I mean, a letter. Yeah, 68. June 68. So probably really March 68 or something. Uh, and he wrote in a letter basically praising having Captain America and the Black Panther meet up and that they were his two favorite characters, he said in the letter. And I'm trying to remember, but I don't think Doug Munch ever wrote, Doug Munch, Mensch, ever wrote Captain America or the Black Panther when he came to uh, Marvel. I kind of associate him with uh, Shang-Chi and there's another, he was, a, he was one of my favorite writers actually uh, in the, in the Bronze Age. But, uh, not here. I, did he write Planet of the Apes? I know, I'm trying to remember. Anyway, he was a really cool writer, but I don't remember him doing that. Man, I just love this art. So yeah, so I read that. And then out of the unmarked box, I got the Flintstones. I think I basically ended up getting this one for free. Uh, this is, I, I didn't even know Charl Charlton did a run of the Flintstones. Seems more like something Gold Key would do, but... Um, I, there were a couple of Flintstones and I picked out this cover because I really liked it with Fred looking so happy with his cake and he's about to, about to trip up and lose that cake. And it says the Flintstones and Pebbles. But, <laughs> and maybe this just shows how sloppily things were done at Charlton. There's, there's no pet story with Pebbles in it. Uh, I mean, she appears in maybe a panel in the whole comic. There's three or three or four short stories that mostly have to do with uh, with Fred and Barney getting into little bits of mischief and sometimes and treating each other badly, getting into fist fights and stuff over a diamond. Um, yeah, one of them one of them has them just fighting nonstop. and uh, and Fred comes off particularly badly. But I'm trying to I think, yeah, is there pebbles at all in here? So maybe there are other issues that featured Pebbles and they just kept the name on there. Um, but I had fun reading it. I think this is only the second, you know, I love the Flintstones, but I think this is only the second Flintstones comic I've ever read. 
So maybe I, sh I should dip into those more. I always worry that it's going to be an extremely watered down version of the TV show. And maybe it was kind of, but it was kind of fun. And speaking of TV shows, but not TV shows, the always confusing Space Family Robinson Lost in Space. Because this started before the show Lost in Space started. And they, I believe they added the title Lost in Space once the show started. They made an agreement with the show that even though it looked like the show might, might uh, have stolen from this comic book, uh, they just had an agreement to let them put the name Lost in Space on the cover. Um, there's only, there's two kids here and two parents uh, in a space station. There's the space station, a space station that got lost in space and they're trying to find their way back to earth. And every, every issue or so they explore a new planet or in this one, a planetary system where long ago there were human like aliens who fought with these aliens who live on a, uh, was it a planet of Mercury? Um, a methane type planet. So this is methane based life rather than oxygen based life. And uh, they've been waiting for the evil humans to come back who they had a war with thousands of years ago. So the our poor adventurers get caught in the middle and they, uh, they meet an android, a humanoid android uh, who's been taking care of this space station inside a meteor or inside an asteroid. And there's a few of the humans of the race that was living on this planet or this solar system in suspended animation for thousands of years, just waiting for some human to come wake them up. And now they're going to get into this giant spaceship to find a new planet. Anyway, it, it was full of really cool science fiction concepts. It's a very stiff story, as you kind of expect from Gold Key, but there's these really cool concepts and um, the Dan Spiegel art kind of grows on me. So um, I have a lot, I've been collecting a lot of Lost in Space, actually, a lot of Space Family Robinson. I was glad to find another one. I've pretty much tapped out all the ones available in Portland, I think. Um, so I, I, but I have a lot more and I just need to read them because I really enjoy them whenever I read them. And then the piece de resistance of, of the comics I've read this week uh, was The Fly. And this was the gift from uh, Mr. Higgy Pop. And this is a comic from 1961, uh, the, the year I was born. It probably came out either a month before I was born or the month I was born. It's listed as September, and I was born in July. Um, but, and so... And it's number, um, I think it's number 16. Higgy had wrote it on the back of the backing board. It's number 14. It's number 14. And uh, so this is from the Archie Adventure series. And Higgy was showing me uh, a whole bunch of issues of The Fly. And they look, all had beautiful covers. And this one has beautiful interior art too. I haven't looked up because it doesn't list whoops, it doesn't list who the artist is, but it's real sort of classic, you know, beautifully drawn art, beautiful drawings of the of women and human figures. Um, the robots, you know, they're not up there with Jack Kirby's robots, but they're, they're fine. Um, and we got a, a giant fly and it, and the story is very much like the classic Silver Age DC stories. Um, just kind of fun and innocent and a little bit goofy. Uh, and I guess this is the first appearance of Fly Girl. And uh, anyway, it was really cool. And it was not, you know, I suppose some of these kind of comics were kind of sexist, but the woman was, you know, had just as strong a role as the man and uh, they made a great team. So I think, uh, and I was, you know, I only knew, I guess I had an issue or two of the fly, I think uh, during the Rich Buckler period of the Archie superheroes, whoops. Um, and the, these Archie superheroes have gone under different labels over time, but I didn't know there was this whole run of the fly and I'm gonna be searching for more books 
Um, so yeah, Higgy really turned me on to, to something that is very interesting to me. So I'm a, I'm a little embarrassed now that I didn't look up who the artists or writers were, the creators were on these books before doing this video. So I'll probably do it right after this video. So anyway, uh, thanks. Thanks Higgy Pop for being a nice host to me and just having a great, great time. We will definitely get together again because I keep coming back to Connecticut. I think he said in his video, he's never going to Portland, <laughs> but uh, maybe I'll drag him out there someday. So I hope all of you are having a great time. Give me a little prayer that my uh, airplane flies out tomorrow and I'll talk to y'all later. Bye-bye.